What is so beautiful about biology as illuminated by evolution is that you, me, everyone currently alive is the product of an unbroken chain of births going all the way back to the first single-celled organisms. Over billions of years, this chain has been linked together by the very natural process of reproduction. But what if there was a better way to give birth? What if, oh, I don't know, we flung babies out of bodies with giant centrifuges? Wait, <laughs> what? That's right. Today we're physicsing babies. Baby. Now entering the facility. In 1965, the U.S. Patent Office granted an application for, quote, an apparatus for facilitating the birth of a child by centrifugal force, conceived <laughs> by husband and wife attorney team George and Charlotte Blonsky. The device, which was more or less an adjustable spinning table with a bunch of straps, was supposed to work exactly how you think it's supposed to work. The Blonsky's baby centrifuge called for a pregnant woman to be strapped to this table with their heads centered at the axis of rotation. In between the woman's legs would be a flexible net, of course, positioned perfectly to catch flying babies. Wow. When the pregnant woman was strapped down and secure, an attending physician would then use some math to determine the necessary RPMs to subject them to. The idea being at some rotational velocity, the forces induced would overcome the frictional and compressive forces of the birth canal. And then in addition to the woman's own pushing efforts, oops, that's a baby in a net. Now, the Blonskys thought a device like this was necessary and might sell and revolutionize things because, in their words, their words, I can't stress that enough, more civilized women didn't have the time to develop the necessary pushing musculature that more primitive women did. Yikes. But, 60-year-old morality aside for a second, this isn't the craziest idea I've ever heard. No, that's the idea on the internet that Finland doesn't exist? People on the internet are, ugh. The baby centrifuge isn't the craziest idea I've ever heard, just crazy problematic, because of the centrifugal force. Now, I know when I say that word, you might have flashbacks to Physics 101, where some guy with a ponytail trying to teach you physics said everything you intuit about forces is wrong and some of them are fake. <gasps> but just stick with me for a second because it's very useful for our discussion today, so let's try it. Now, imagine that you are in a car and you're going around a circle to the left. Maybe you're in NASCAR, turning left for a few hours and sweating out 11 pounds of water as you do so like Dale Earnhardt Jr. Woo! Now, if I asked you what forces you were feeling in the car, you would report as you turned left that you felt some pushing force to the right. But if you asked me, watching you from the stands, who go Dale, raise hail, who? I would say that there's nothing pushing on you at all. I'm just observing your mass and the inertia that your mass has kind of fighting against the motion of the car as your mass wants to continue straight. Now, both of these options are true. But which observation is real? Well, they're both real, that's relativity for you, baby, but only you in the car going left, who have to invoke some kind of force that explains your motion that's perspective dependent. Now this is the centrifugal force and it's why this is considered fictitious because we disagree and I'm an inertial frame of reference. But it's still a very useful idea for one, makes the math a heck of a lot easier. Wait, so humans just pop out of other humans? Well, yeah, more or less. Gross. <laughs> I know, right? Ugh. Centrifugal math isn't all that bad. For example, if we were to get on one of my facility hyper rails and travel in a circular track, the fictitious centrifugal force that I would start to feel would increase according to the product of my mass, our angular velocity squared, and the distance I am from the center of rotation. Now, as the velocity starts to increase, so too would the fictitious force, and eventually the force would get so large oh, that you would feel almost thrown to the, oh, my back, almost thrown to the outside edge. But what if I wasn't some physics guy with a ponytail trying to teach you? What if I was a baby? And what if this hyper rail wasn't a transport? It was another kind of tunnel. <laughs> Stop it. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
As we know from smart boy Isaac Newton, anything experiencing a net force is going to be accelerating. Force equals mass times acceleration, and in a centrifuge, that's no different. The further you are away from the center of rotation, the faster your angular velocity, the more you are going to accelerate. And then at some point, the acceleration is gonna get so high that you're gonna pass 9.8 meters per second every second, and then you're gonna start pulling G's as a multiple of this 9.81, and you're gonna start getting literally heavier as measured on a scale, like you were in uh, Goku's gravity chamber or something. But if your body uh, was somehow rigidly supported, then maybe anything not attached to you would feel compelled to leave you, I don't know, something like a baby. Did you just give birth to a calculator? No. Stop it. What? <laughs> no, it turned on. No. <laughs> I have to call Texas Instruments and tell them that I'm, I'm a calculator daddy. The centrifugal force has a sister force. It's called the centripetal force, and it's more or less the same. It's just pointed in an opposite direction. It has the same magnitude, but the centripetal force is the one that gets all the attention because it's one of the ways we can create artificial gravity in space. So observe this here bucket that I borrowed from one of my facility staff members. In this bucket, I have some water. Now, obviously, if I just turned the bucket upside down, the water would pour out. But if I turn this bucket around in a circle with some acceleration, then the centrifugal force will push the water towards the bottom of the bucket, but the centripetal force will push upwards from the bottom of the bucket, equal out, and the water should stay in the same place. This is exactly how we would create artificial gravity in space. So observe. Now keep in mind, I do in fact have water in this bucket, okay? <laughs> Look at me. I'm a space station. Of course then, it follows that if I was to stop this bucket spinning at any time, any artificial gravity you'd have in a space station would go away and gravity on Earth here, like with this bucket, would more or less take over. Look, Aria, my water broke. Stop it. Yeah, sorry. And so finally, we return to birth by centrifuge. Now that we understand all the operative forces involved, we can go back to the patent document and page through it. As we do so, we come upon the only table of numbers in the whole document, and we see that this device was supposed to make birthing easier by subjecting pregnant women, mind you, on one of the most stressful and painful days of their entire lives to up to seven Gs of acceleration. So this was supposed to make the birthing process easier by having effectively a 54 pound baby weighing on the womb. This device, yes, was hypergravity just for the stuff. <laughs> it just sounds so easy. Just get naked, strap in, spin up, and that's a centrifuge baby in a net between your legs. Easy. It's, it's sure, Blonsky's. Surely you will revolutionize the multiplication of humans. I mean, it won an Ig Nobel Prize, surely. But of course, the Blonsky's invention never revolutionized how humans enter meat space. Although there was a single model built for a science museum in Ireland, and you can go see it today, the device was never manufactured in mass, nor was it used for even a single birth. It turns out the idea of strapping yourself naked to a spinning table at 7 G's was not the most uh, ideal thing in the world in front of strangers. It would be just as armchair physics-y of me to suggest, oh, I don't know, birth by bungee jump, which uses acceleration in the same way. Let this be a lesson to all you would-be sciencers out there. Just because something is theoretically plausible does not mean that it's not wildly impractical. Until next time. I mean, I might as well suggest like birth by rocket sled. Kevin, get a post-it note. Now exiting the facility.
Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Bretton Campbell and visiting scholar Jacob Greer. If you want to get on the facility staff, if you want to join me and over 1,200 nerds who are talking with me every day on Discord, giving me episode ideas, showing me their pets, they're getting episodes a day early, and live streams that no one else can see, you can join the facility today at patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. And if you support us in our nerdy educational mission just enough, you get your name on Aria here each and every week, and she's an AI. <laughs> and there's hundreds and hundreds of you, so I have no idea how I'm gonna pass the t See, I made the Blonsky's device sound very ridiculous, and it is a little misguided in how it thinks it would make things easier on a very stressful and painful day, as I said, but that's not to say that it didn't have some interesting ideas. In the world of patents, there's other patents, they're always looking to each other for interesting components to more or less slot into their own design. Case in point, the Blonsky's baby centrifuge was cited by a NASA patent application to create artificial gravity for humans in space. So it's not the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard. Neither was it for NASA. Wah! Thanks for watching. Wah!